Let me tell you a little something about me. When it's Saturday night, I need to blow off some steam. One, two, three, four. Well, I've been holding in since the clock in my morning. From the end of the week, I'm a bum 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 about to blow. Breeze walking through the hall, get on like a pack of wolves now. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Equipment Talk, and it's from iRay. So we have a guest here today, special guest, and his name is Russell. Yeah. Russell, again, my name is Colonel Ray Henry, and we are going to have a little talk on somewhat of programming. So again, Russell, you uh, your background, you come from the, uh, what? where did you, where'd you originate from? Well, I'm originally from Aberdeen, South Dakota. I guess I have done a lot of government kind of specific uh, programming applications, utilities. I since had moved into kind of a consultant role um, working for different Fortune 500 companies. There's been Verizon, LifeTouch, Keurig. So with the government, um, have you been, uh, you mean you're one of them high security kind of guys? Yes, yes, there is. So, um, so you're the guy that snoops out for people that are hacking and stuff like that? Did you kind of do that stuff or what? Uh, no, not really. Uh, to prevent people like that. Oh, you're the preventer, huh? The preventer. <laughs> you got to know what they're doing and what to how to create the right safeguards, I guess. You got to know what to look for. So they did teach us how to hack. And so how many years did it take you to kind of figure out this programming stuff that you're doing and and, and w where you came from? Well, um, no, it's, no, what made you interested in it first? Let's say interested that. is um, it, the same as a lot of other programmers out there. I uh, played a lot of video games, wanted to become that guy. So you got to be a video game player to be a programmer. Huh? Well, they do go hand in hand. I mean, it's that passion that creates when you can't get to the next level that lets you, you know, hit that next wall and get up and keep going. I mean, the passion that comes with the creation of software is that exact same thing. So right? does, does that mean that you have to have really good mathematical skills? Do you need those? Is that part of it? Um, a part of it. I, I think the overall thought process of thinking abstractly, I guess, is the same as the mathematics. I mean, the mathematics really don't come into play until you are talking specific animations of how people walk, um, how objects around them fall, and you need to step this way, that way, that is common with the physics, I guess, behind the movement in video games. Um, but when it comes to accounting software and different kind of applications, no, other than one plus one equals two, there is not much mathematics. But um, that abstract thinking helps you get through the problems that are presented to you, if that makes sense. So let's say that if you were a guy that's really good at math, where would you say that it was a good spot for them to go in the programming world? Yeah, once once again, it's really just the problem solving. Um, not knowing what's coming up next, being able to provide that different things. But when specific mathematics are applied, it is that is the the physics as far as motion. So how, how far off do you feel that um, you would be from being a programmer for autonomous vehicles? How would that kind of, I mean, how, have you really looked into that at all and seen how that works or? Uh, specifically in the professional world, no, I haven't had much applications, but I could see where the applications of the physics, you know, knowing what's around you, how to push off of it, you know, really come to some sort of either a magnet, you know, that pushes people back and forth away from it, or the whole physics side of it, where the math would be applied. If this object is so close to me, then stutter step left or right, you know? So what would, um, let's say that uh, if you were going to go out and program, say, autonomous skid loader or autonomous dozer or even autonomous excavator what would you think of as the type of person that would be ideal for that type of programming and what would they need for skill sets to do that it would be more of your video game programming um definitely a i guess a computer science background um, something as far as skid loader and something like that, you want to have some concrete background. 
Um, I don't think their first project out of college should be let's let's program this thing. It could possibly run over my house, I guess. So, I mean, that would definitely be a bad thing. So you, uh, but so it would be more of the physics side of thing and motion that I would be looking for. So I wouldn't be specifically, oh, I worked for QuickBooks. I know how to run your accounting system. Well, maybe you're not well suited enough to run over my house or uh, um, push dirt or whatever you'd like to do with the automation of that. Because of the liability that comes behind it, there should be some concrete application of the physics side of it, I guess. So if you're saying that uh, they should probably, when they come out of high school or, or graduate school or something of that nature with the program, and they should probably look at drones or something programming yep, them. Yep. Up. Something that has had applied motion. I, maybe mechanical engineering. Maybe that's what you're looking for. Yeah. So, I mean, well, what, what would be a good example of mechanical engineering? Uh, anything with a motor that, that, that can do a request, I guess. I mean, so like start up, shut down. Yep. Rev yep. up, rev down. Yep, yep. And all of it be automated, I guess. Um, mechanical, when you stop and think about it, really is just that. It's anything with an engine. I mean, and... Be electric? Yep, yep, pretty much. Uh, well, electric is a little bit, you know, maybe on the fence just because there is electrical engineering. But when you think of that, that's more the circuits and the load capacity, stuff like that with motherboard. My son actually... Um, started his career path in the mechanical engineering and he decided to shift more into software. Um, we created a little rocket that he had to break the atmosphere and just out of anything. How far up the atmosphere? Uh, 30,000, I think it's 32,000 feet. Um, 32,000. I believe so. It's, it's something like that. Are you, might have to fact check me on that, but I, <laughs> I don't know. That but you ain't he, the one that had a program. He, he did, did, right? Yep, yep. He did. He had to collect as much data. Um, they we simply just put GoPro and um, all the thing. Well, I will say it was kind of a flop for him. <laughs> it did gather the data and get back to Earth, and we were able to transpose said data. It just didn't make the height requirements, I guess. Um, he so went, it only went up like. 20,000 feet or something? It was something like that. It, it, now, did you have I mean, a barometric pressure meter on it, electronic? We did. Or? We did. There, really? there was something that judged pressure because pressure definitely becomes a problem. Uh, another thing that you don't think of is it doesn't take very long and it's really cold out there. <laughs> oh, you I mean up in the air, you mean? Yeah, there is greenhouse effect down on the root of the earth. It doesn't take long and it's negative a lot of degrees. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the exact exact. What, when you're in an airplane traveling from point A to point one or B, whatever, although it could be, you know, 60 degrees at land, you are looking at negative probably 60 to 100 degrees, even below even, on Fahrenheit. Yep. You know, even, even when you're flying 30,000 feet, even when you're flying to Vegas. <laughs> wow. I mean, I know a lot of those planes will fly between 25 and 35,000 feet. Yep. Something like that. You are you are definitely cold. I've been in a plane. <laughs> yes, yes. Most people have. But and, I have had a heater in there, though. <laughs> yes. Um, if you were to look at the uh, L, or the temperature on the outside of that plane, you'd be pretty surprised. Yeah, I think it's uh, that you can fly uh, VFR on up till ten thousand because ten thousand is your ceiling for oxygen. If you get up past yep. ten thousand feet, then the oxygen level gets dropped, and and I, I get where you're coming from there. It, it'd yep. be a whole different animal. So what? What really uh, happened then after your son went through all these things? He's working for the government now? Well, he's actually working for Boeing. He is creating oh, different. Yep, yeah, Boeing. He's doing different applications for the government, um, specifically for military. He's working, working out of uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And his name's Jeff Ross, if you watch it. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> Hope everything's well. Um, so is he high security? It, uh, I'm not sure as far as his clearance. He doesn't talk to me too much about it specifically what he does. It's more the object orientated. Hey, Dad, do you think they could help me out with this kind of thing? I got, oh, I got, oh, so you help him program a little bit once a time. little bit or I give mean, some advice. He's probably became smarter than I, so um, <laughs> he gives me advice more. But uh, there is definitely times when he calls me where he's stumped. But it's programming specific. It's, a, you know, some kind of a switch statement. You know, what would you do in this environment on these? And and that's kind of segue into another thing where I think your object orientated kind of programming styles that a lot of people use are going dead because of the uh, new cloud based solutions and the stuff that. Well, even recently, I found out about the JavaScripts becoming more popular and languages like Angular and everything are doing away with uh 
your Java, C++, but yeah, enough about all that. Yeah. So now um, you're working uh, as a programmer and doing what right now? Um, right now, um, just kind of been brought aboard to um, just kind of... Brought with IRA. With IRA. Okay. Yes. So you're I'm on one of the newer team. employees. Oh, you know, on IRA's team. I yes. thought I'd let him spill it instead of well, me saying something. Well, I didn't know if I should spill it. Um, That's cool. IRA kind of brought me aboard just kind of to fill that gap, um, provide the business need for new platforms and new software technologies that they come up with and deeming them good or bad. And then, I don't know, assigning the internal workings to make them all work. Not necessarily all 100% hands on but providing my expertise when I can, I guess. So in your programming now, like for iRay, what types of things are we moving into with iRay that are going to keep iRay at the forefront of the, um, let's say, the uh, business industry or, or the uh, auction world or any of that? What, what do you feel in your, uh, and, and you know, here, I should probably ask you this first. What gave you the inkling to want to work with IRA companies? Um, or I, I like that mid tier, I guess. Um, you, uh, working, working with the fortune 500, you know, the Verizons and everything like that, you kind of become a number, I guess. And that number kind of makes you feel a little dispersonal. I mean, less like a family. There's less of that great uh, "I belong" kind of feeling. I mean, you, <laughs> do, we, do we try to make you belong? Well, well, yes, yes. You feel like you're a part of something. You're achieving something. It feels like your attributes, whether you succeed or fail, reflect everything. You know, and it puts responsibility. But at the end of the day, it also gives you pride. It gives you um, kind of why everybody wants to get up and go to work every day. Nobody. Nobody wants to feel like a cog <laughs> or, or, or a wrench in a cog. Right? Yeah. Or, or, <laughs> or that too. And, um, I like IRA. You guys are innovative. Um, you try to think of solutions out of the box and you really cater to that mid tier, the people that get forgotten about that don't have the budget to, to really afford a sales force or, uh, you know, some of them big IBM, you know, you gotta be a fortune 500 company to implement it. But why? I mean, there is software solutions for everybody. And it's those guys that really have the bigger need, I guess, your sm small ma and pa's that can really, really benefit from that same platform. And I, I think as you release things, you're going to, you're going to you find that niche a little bit. And um, just that personalization as well. So, so what has been uh, maybe some of your better experiences that you've had with IRA in the last few weeks or days or whatever you had there that you felt really kind of it helped you connect with IRA and what they're doing and, and how they're going about, you know, working through in the industry? Well, um, some of the better experiences, just, just your willingness to be flexible, um, I guess, and understanding that you always don't get to point E by a straight line. Sometimes there is a fork in the road. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, it, sometimes it can become a maze. It's not just a fork. It's a fork beyond forks. And sometimes you got to backpedal and realize you made the wrong decision or, you know, we should have went there and we went and went there. I mean, it's all part of research and development. Um, yeah, point A to point B isn't always a straight line. You need that, you need that flexibility and understanding in order to produce a quality good as well. Um, um, even Albert Einstein, I bet you it took him a while to come up with that E equals MC squared. <laughs> he probably had it E cubed, you know, it don't make no sense. And he's like, Oh no, that didn't work. Let's go back to the drawing board. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And you guys, you guys have been flexible to that. And, um, understanding and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you just get a better, more solid quality product. So props to IRA on that one. So what do you think that um, is going to really bring IRA to the forefront of the auction industry that they're in? Um, a good customer base, uh, still getting out there, shaking hands and being, you know, caring about the customer, I guess is first. I mean, it, and it's still cool the way that you guys even just get on the phone and call through that client list, make sure, Hey, how's your day going? Do you guys have needs? I mean, not losing that, that, that personal ability. Yeah. Personal ability. And, and that speaks volumes, at least to me, especially since I've seen the fortune 500 
side of things, I guess. I'm not going to keep bashing on companies, but <laughs> uh, that, that's not right either. But um, that personability, uh, you guys haven't lost. You guys have grown. You went through a more online presence as far as your auctions go um, and stuff like that. It's big and it's bringing a bigger customer base. But at the end of the day, you guys have put people closer to those locations. You're still out there shaking the hands, being like, hey, maybe our needs don't suit you, but just give us a chance, you know? Yeah. And even just that, hey, maybe we're not the right fit for you per se, you're going to direct them in the right way to go. You, you know, even when it's shifting business elsewhere, that says a lot as a company. And um, you guys are finding a way to build that into a software model. I don't know how much I can say about that one either, but um, if stars align, I mean, it, it's going to make you more productive with the yeah, higher. And, and even with us now, you know, that um, people can actually take their own photos. They can get um, there's drop downs for equipment so they yes. can actually go on our fleet management right on our web page and load up their own equipment. Uh, we've tried to make it so that um, people have it to their convenience. So we're not actually going there and saying, hey, I'm taking your time now. You're going to have to take off work yep. to do this. Yep. Instead, you know, when you get a rain day or something to that nature, you can go out and take them photos, take the time that you have at that time. And we don't take your time. And I think that, you know, bringing you on as a programmer and or IT, uh, that is, you know, it's kind of a main focus for us is to help our customers to be more efficient, number one, but not only that, to take that technology that you have and we bring it to what we have. Yep. And we try to, you know, kind of pull it all together and mesh it together so that, you know, we don't take that personability away. Yep. We don't lose the uh, credibility of not only respect, but also um, the highest uh, effort that we have to not only market a piece, but to get the best price for both our buyers and sellers so that they can come together and, you know, and have a good product for the money. You yep. know, it doesn't matter if it has re needs repairs, doesn't matter if it has this or that, as long as we're disclosing what it is and what it isn't. Yep. And it, it really, you kind of just hit the nail on the head right there by virtualizing it. Uh, there's, there's time and resources that can be summed up by the online platform that necessarily hasn't been put out there by any other one. But you guys will still hand them, help them with the title handoffs. You, you know, you still provide those personal services that can get lost. So that, that's why I think you guys are going to succeed. It's a good mesh. So now you understand that, uh, remember the time I asked you about, um, do you think that you could get uh, a program or program, a drone, a dro uh, what do you call them, drone? Drone, drone. yes, yeah, yes. And so it can fly around a unit and then get the photos and everything else that we need to really deliver to our customers so they give them the information that they need to make a good choice or decision. Yeah, I did. did. You know, I thought you threw a curveball out there, but I think I found a solution. There yeah, actually, right. there is a drone out there that, if delivered to a client, could do exactly what you're saying. Wow. Um, and it'd probably be a lot of fun for us programmers, too, trying to figure out exactly how to play with these coordinates to make it work perfectly. But, yeah, that that would be another thing that you would probably be first to the market with you know it's that kind of innovative thinking you know um who's gonna stop us you know because everybody thinks there's a barrier um but uh, you try to step above those barriers and i give i give a lot of props to ira for that um and the software suite that they plan to put out to people even the even the use of your platform and the way you've taken it and streamlined you know, COVID put a lot of barriers with the in 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 person kind of side of the auction business, and you guys also did a good job of streamlining that. Um, their auctions are held once a month. You can, anybody that's out there can just log in and start bidding on something if they want it. Um, or they is, could even load stuff up and have us approve it and put it on. Yep, they can even sell it. Yeah, they they can be in. Um, let me think of a town. They can they could be in New York. They could be in New York. They could be in New York, and we could sell it right here in Minnesota. Isn't that something? Yep. And they would be satisfied if they did. Yeah. I mean, you guys, you guys give a good service, that's for sure. So, um, you know, we we have a government contract right now with the state of Minnesota, yep. and it's a specialty contract selling their heavy equipment and so on and so forth. And and the one thing that we found that you know it, it that contract hit COVID hit at the same time, and. Uh, but we had to do is we had to give them more attention than what we really had to, but we knew we had to. And what I mean by that is, is that we had to give them training. 
we had to give them, uh, you know, a good understanding of why we're training you that way and why we need this information. We had to program, we had to get programs done so that that way that they could actually utilize them and make them, uh, you know, uh, usable for them. And not only for them, that it would come back to the public because they're kind of the public eye, right? Right, I right. Mean, that's yep. what they're selling for is yep. the public because the public owns it. They don't own it. Right. And they had to make good choices. So, and by the way, they were really good at beating us up on price too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, I was very surprised that, you know, a lot of these guys, I thought, they're not going to catch on that easy or that quick because, you know, they're in their 50s and, and you know, in, in yep. that era, you know, and not to say that they're slower in that era, but the tech, you know, the technical piece of it. But, you know, uh, I do have to hand it to the other programmers that I've had on and that do have on that have made it easy. They made it simple. And that's what I like to see with programming is easy and simple. I mean, yep. because... When you can do that, you can actually make it fun, you know, yep, and we yep. can take and keep the fun in it, you know. Especially when they see that uh, price tag or whatever they're getting at the end of it. I mean, and you guys have done a good job with the usability being like, you know, pretty easier than to use the most social networking platforms. I mean, if you got a Facebook account, you can figure out how to sell something on IRA, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you don't even probably need a Facebook account. But yeah, well, the usability is about that simple, though. I mean, All right. I mean, I taught my grandma how to use Facebook, and I'm pretty sure I could teach her how to use uh, sell, sell her old car or whatever <laughs> with you on IRA. Right? Yeah, that'd be pretty easy. Yeah. Um, and, and that's another thing that you guys haven't lost focus with when... Um, coming out with new innovative thing. I guess the usability um, has been has been center stone to all your requirements. And I think that's going to pay dividends, but it also stays true to the rest of what I say. Um, you want the moms and pas and, you know, people without a full-fledged IT staff to be able to, you know, use things and do things and not have it as a big hurdle as the barrier to entries because not everybody has that, you know, tech budget. Yeah. Um, well. IT, IT is not cheap, but it comes in the form of salaries, I guess. So, And what we have is we thought, you know, that um, iRay, if we can get you guys, and, and I say you guys as programmers, to build and to make things easier for our customers, then we can do is we could actually deliver a new product to our customers that they not only could utilize to help them remarket their unused or their equipment that they maybe want to replace or whatever. And also that we had come up with a actual a new company too that's yeah it's Brad Software. It's yeah, Brad Brad Software. Software. And I'll tell you what, uh it's gonna be phenomenal. You can have your own business back. Yep. You don't have to worry about these Fortune 500 companies owning your data because where you house your data is where who owns it, right? Right, right. So that's really the real thing of, I mean, that's one thing you, that people don't understand is that, you know, years ago, you started your own business, you had your own clientele list, you have your own, you know, trucking, you had your own things that, you know, even if you had a sub trucking that trucked for you, but you had the, you know, the program and the, and the you know, the process and procedures in place. Today, even if you have them in place, somebody could start up and just yep. mimic them and take everything away from you in just a matter of months. Right, right. It's unreal. So what we've done is that uh, we have actually, with Brad Software, we're going to bring the future back from the past <laughs> of you owning your business to the future of you owning your business. Cause we're going to sell right, you a platform. Right, right. We're not going to give it, we're not going to have a marketplace that you work out of like everybody else does. We're going to sell you a platform. Yep. And so then it's you... not through IRA. It's going to be through Brad software. But again, we were the forefront for the, um, uh, what do we call it? Uh, I used to call it Guinea pig, but now it's not yep. Guinea pig. What do we call it? <laughs> it's becoming, I'd, I'd say closer to its beta. Beta testing. There beta. we go. I mean, um, I was waiting. I was waiting for something to be said like this, and thought I'd let you drop the ball. But yeah. <laughs> no, there, there is. There's quality in that. But once again, it sticks to your mission statement of you're sticking up for the middleman. Um, the middleman has been taken advantage of, I guess, a little bit by these cloud-based solutions and losing exactly that their control. And at the end of the day, they just see the uh, price go up and up every month. For a different service. Out. It's like the fuel yep, cost, right? Yep, yep. So, it, yeah. 
So you came up with a pretty good solution for that middleman. Yeah. And um, I'm excited to see it go. And I'm excited of the potential, I guess. So. Well, and um, like I said, we, we have a, a great team of programmers. And with that being said, that, um, you know, you guys have, uh, uh, you know, worked uh, many different solutions to help us to come to the product that we're going to have and use. Uh, just like I was saying that, you know, that our customers need to know values, right? And right. the only way they're going to get that is that we can take um, similar values that are out there and bring them into a, um, a one user place. Yep. You know, right now, a lot of people Google it, right? Right. Well, uh, there's a lot of variables in there that aren't taken out when you Google something, right? Right. So when you're building something for, let's say, iRay or for Brad software, you're going to take it down to the particulars that are within the realm of what they're looking at, right? Right, 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 right. Um, there is, there um, is um, a lot of different solutions that need to be approached, but we got to think of them as a most holistic, um, genuine piece of software, I guess. And um, there is quality, even if it takes a, another minute or two. And I've tried to do that, design it, and so have the rest programmers we try to think of it all it's hard to think of all of it but we try to come up with the most comprehensive user-friendly piece of software we can provide yeah and, and i know that um you know with even brad software that uh, the ai system is is come into place and um and using an ai system it, it's really been unique in my book because that you know you can do it one time you don't have to do it right this Three, off, four, or five times. We know what steps you took to get there. We're going to shortcut these steps for you next time because it's a repetitive thing, right? And then we, we can we can achieve point A to point B even with the forks in the road if the outcome's always the same. You know, that's a lot of what my thought, I guess, is behind some of the AI summed up. <laughs> well, I drug you along to a meeting this week, and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna cut her off after this. But um, uh, anyways, I brought you along to a meeting this week. And you experienced it with uh, the um, state, counties, whatever, and their process of wanting to bring items to auction. What experience did you have from that that really made you feel like uh, these guys need you? Yep. Um, it really, with the introduction, I guess, of the COVID and that platform, it, there is a sense of urgency for everything to be online. And you think of an auction where there's an auctioneer selling these devices or whatever. We have done a good job of streamlining that. We have an online kind of platform. People can bid whatever. And there's a need to it all the way back to the state level. Since COVID and everything, they can't. They don't have the platform to house these kind of things, but they still have a not, uh, need for the online marketplace especially their offices in this billion dollar building. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I couldn't even find a janitor. <laughs> they're still out working from home. They're doing whatever. I mean, the janitor just cleans his own home gets well, paid, huh? <laughs> you know, I saw this show on TV once called zombie land. Oh, I mean, God. and it kind of reminded me of the same apocalypse, thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Apocalypse is coming, man. I was, I wanted to come out there with a pitchfork and an AK 47 <laughs> really no, make no, sure not on little, <laughs> maybe not on state grounds. Right? right. Right. I can't even have a cigarette, let alone an AK 47. <laughs> But no, and that's the need for the online marketplace and where I think you've really stood up and gave them the platform. And really, when we left that meeting, I think IRA was number one. I mean, uh, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but no, you you found the right solution. And that's just another way where you're stepping in with that personability and giving the customer exactly what they want. Even if even if you got to bend a little bit on your side, you're you know, at the end of the day, you're sticking up for the little guy. And then even when it's at a state level, I mean, you're even looking out for taxpayer dollars. Look yeah. at you. Yeah. Well, I got to take care of you people. That's what we <laughs> yeah, do. Yeah, that's for sure. So again, uh, I want to thank you so much for coming to the podcast here, Russell. Yep. Uh, you know, I want to thank you for being on the IRA team. And, um, you know, there's other our other programmers out there and and that, uh, that have done a wonderful job and that are working, you know, just... Uh, you know, day and night to deliver a product to our customers and to the world. And I appreciate them all. And again, want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching the podcast. This is Equipment Talk from IRA. And again, Colonel Ray Henry signing off. Thank you.